All right, let's talk a little fundamental theorem of calculus. So anything that starts off with the word fundamental here, you know it's got to be a big deal, right? <laughs> okay, so for the fundamental theorem of calculus, there are two parts, all right? Let's look at part one first. Fundamental theorem of calculus, part one. Now, I will tell you, we're going to write out this part one because it is, um, well, it's just nice to see the mathy words that go with it. All right, that's what's going on here. So we're going to write this out. If f, which is my function right here, is continuous on a b, oops, that's a b, closed interval, from A to B on a closed interval, then the area function, remember, an integral is the area under the curve, so A of X is equal to my integral here from A to X of F of T dt for A is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to capital A. This is continuous on my interval from A to B and differentiable on my open interval from A to B. Then the area, let me scoot this up just a little bit here. So my area function satisfies a prime of x is equal to f of x. Equivalently, a prime of x equals the derivative with respect to x from a to x of f of t dt, which equals f of x. Which means, this is a big one, right? Stick with me, we've got this. Which means that the area function of f is an antiderivative of f on the interval from a to b. All right? Okay, so here's the beauty of the video. You can always pause this or go back and write this down or whatever. But let me give you the real deal Holyfield of what's happening here. All right? I've got a closed interval here on a to b. Then I have my function a of x here. And the kicker to this is the fact that I have an x as one of my bounds. That is not the same variable that is in my um, integral, right? That makes a difference. So x is an actual variable that I'm talking about because here we see for a, which is the beginning of my interval, and then all the way up to my area function, all right? Okay, and this is continuous on that interval. Continuous on the closed, differentiable on the open, right? So equivalently, my derivative here is equal to f of x. So the derivative means I'm taking the derivative of this inter integrand in my interval and I'm going to plug that x in because that equals f of x. So here, my derivative equals, whenever I have this value, this x value, I plug that into whatever function this is, and I get f of x. Literally, that's it. So this looks a lot freakier than what it actually is. The fundamental theorem of calculus part one is taking a derivative. So if I have a derivative here, I want to find a derivative. That's what this is asking for is a derivative. So if you are asked to find the derivative and your bound is a variable, you're going to take that and plug that into whatever you have in here 
And then that is what you're going to get as your derivative because a prime of x equals f of x. a prime of x equals f of x. All right? So here's the moral of this story. Let's, let's talk about this here in real language. Basically, you are just going to take the upper bound variable and plug it into the function of the integral. That's it. It's literally just that it. So that's a whole lot of words. And so that you got the background behind it. Sometimes I think it's good to look at all the mathy stuff. But the moral of the story, what's going to happen is you're going to be looking at this integral and you've got a variable up here. You just literally plug it in and then that's your answer. All right. Finding the derivative. Look at this one. Uh, let's go black on this so that we can have a different color. I am asked to find the derivative here of example 5a d over dx, so taking the derivative with respect from 1 to x of sine squared t dt. Literally, take the derivative with respect to x. That's why we spend so much time on looking at those variables in that differential. With respect to x, there's my x. Take your x and plug it in. Our answer to this is sine squared x. There is no plus c. I am not trying to integrate at all. All we're doing is taking the derivative. So the fundamental theorem of calculus part one says when you take the derivative and your integral has that variable, plug that bad boy in. <laughs> no big deal, right? Let's do a couple more. Here is example 5b. This is the derivative with respect to x here of x to the 5 of the square root of t squared plus 1 dt. Now, that's a plus 1. Where is my x now? It's on the bottom. Can't have that. The x needs to go to the top. So how do I do that? What was one of those rules that we learned? So that's going to take it to the top. We learned it in 5.2. Yes. So if I make this negative, so I've got the derivative with respect to the x of negative 5 to x because you flip the bounds and make it the opposite, right? t squared plus 1 dt. Now I can plug that in. Negative square roots of x squared plus 1, and then that's all there is to it. All right? Okay. Let's look at this one. Example 5c. I have the derivative with respect to x from 0 to x squared of cosine t squared dt. Now, this is not cosine squared, right? It's just the cosine t squared. Now, here's the deal. I am taking a derivative. So whenever I go to plug this x squared in, let's actually make it like this. I plug this x squared in here. So far, everything we've done has just been an x by itself that we've plugged in. All right? So look what happens whenever we plug in something with x squared. Then I've got cosine here of x squared squared. But remember, when you take a derivative and you have a function in a function, you have to chain that, right? So I'm going to chain that, and then I'm going to multiply this here by a 2x. So anytime, yep, you plug a function into a function, you have to chain it. I'm going to bring that 2x, <clears throat> pardon me, that 2x in front. Just because it's a coefficient just makes it easier there. All right. Okay. So normally up here when it's just x, we're still chaining this. But when you plug in just a plain x, what's the derivative of x? 1, right? So it's like multiplying it by a 1. So we have been chaining this whole time, but with just the plain x, you don't have to worry about it. It's still a derivative, so when you plug in a function, you got to make sure you take care of that function. Let's do one more like that. So I have 5.3.76, just so you can see another one. I'm going to take the derivative here with respect to x from 0 to x cubed. I've got dt over t squared plus 4. 
All right. Okay. Let's do this. So how can I rewrite this? If this dt is on the top, isn't that the exact same thing as the derivative with respect to x from 0 to x cubed of 1 over t squared plus 4 dt? Right? Yeah, same thing. I just didn't want you to get confused because that dt was in the numerator. It's still just the differential, but remember when you multiply, you can multiply across, and that's where the dt comes in. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you were good with that. All right, now I'm going to take this x cubed and plug it in. Ooh, I've got a function. So I'm plugging that in. So I've got 1 over x cubed squared plus 4, right? But because I have this function, then I'm going to multiply by the derivative. So then I actually end up with, ooh, I'm out of room. 3x squared over power to a power you multiply. So it's x to the 6 plus 4. Not bad, right? The moral of the story. I'm taking a derivative with that integral, so you plug it in. This fundamental theorem of calculus part one is amazing, and it's used sometimes, but part two, which is what we're getting ready to do, that. When people say use the fundamental theorem of calculus, it is part two that they're talking about. This, yes, part one, and it is used, but not nearly as often as this next one we're getting ready to talk about. Okay, cool.